Well, well he has happened. I just to make two points that I knew that René or Johannes will be before that. So I decided to not make a general introduction to the area because, as you heard, he made a wonderful introduction. So it's a bit cheeky that I use. I'm piggybacking on what Johannes uh, said. And the second thing which I want to mention is that we had to submit the abstracts and the titles, as you know, ages ago. And I changed my mind since then. So it's, I'm not going to talk exactly about what you are seeing here. And the other two authors are also here. So we sort of, uh, I, I developed further from what I submitted in the abstract. Is it just one like this? So I'll start my, uh, well, I'll start with two images. And you've seen a lot of these. And this is the site of Nebelivka, which is about 20 kilometers to the south of what Johannes just showed you. And as, you, as he pointed out, there will be a regular planning. And as you can see, this is a very regular, and uh, if you zoom out, you zoom in, rather, you will see that there are some variation. But in general, you don't need degree in archaeology to see that this is actually something which is very regular, very planned. Something made a, quite an effort to do that. It's not something that grow out of nothing. There is something which seriously went, uh, uh, a serious planning went on. So uh, the size of the Belivka is 238 hectares. And it is on the basis of uh, about 90 uh, radiocarbon dates. It dates to the early part of the fourth millennium BC. And this one is a geophys is interpretation plan of the geophysical plan. And what you see, the red things here are actually houses, structures, dwellings, whatever you want, burned. Therefore, they're in red. Well, the other color, we are not quite sure. And we have almost 1,500 of those. Right. So to uh, build these, we need about 67 hectares of forest. And, oops, did I do something wrong? Yes, I did. And this is based on, uh, because some of, the, uh, some of the, there is a great debate, are they two story, one story houses? So we made it, decided to do it in between. And since I told you that quite a lot of them are burnt, so you need about 760 hectares of forest to burn them. And we know that because we made an experiment. We built two houses and we burned one of them. And I, at this point, I would like to remind you that this is, we are in the forest step. We are not in Northern Europe. We are not in uh, uh, where there's loads of wood. You go and do whatever you want. Food, uh, sorry, wood is very, very scarce there. So think about that before we know. That's something which nobody talks about, and I'll come to that later. Why? So this is the first image. The second image, oh, sorry. And here I want to turn the, the question of the session the other way around. According to which definition of a village, this is a village. Uh, how, having in mind that the critical mass of that time of settlement, about 80%, 80-90%, is about, I'll, I'll give it a go, I'll, I'll say it's one hectare. They're not one hectare, but let's say they're one hectare. So one hectare village and 238 hectare village. How is 300, oh, 3,000 delegates of EAA the same as the 30 delegates of EAA. Just tell me how. How do we function together? How we organize our uh, uh, logistics? How we go, how is it the same thing? Because that's what we are told to believe. And I also would like to ask, how is that Neolithic? How is this a small holding in which we go, we have a small garden, and then we go and do our daily business? of 238 hectares. How is that happening? And how is that possible? The second image is that is the Poland diagram, which I appreciate you can't see, but I'm prepared to share it if you want to come and see that in more detail. So I'll summarize it for you. Yesterday, I was at a session about um, the uh, crisis in archaeological theory, and then Tim Taylor finished the, with a slide and said, we have to stop saying uh, we have no evidence for. We have to start saying, we have evidence that there is no, so that's how I took that, and what I'm saying now, so we have the evidence that there is no for a massive deforestation, rather than what more subtle way of trying to put it yesterday. So we have low to moderate serial point for, uh, fallen, and we have a micro, uh, no micro charcoal evidence for massive fire. Don't forget, uh, almost two thirds of these things were burnt, and we have no evidence for massive fires. And the reason I want to put these two uh, images next to each other is because I've been giving a serial, uh, not uh, only me, but the other uh, co-authors, we have been giving that talk or variants of that talk along the side many times, and we get different reactions. 
from positive. Like, how that is possible? Something is wrong. Or oh, let's, let's figure it out. And on the basis of these positive things, we sort of went back to the drawing board and tried to see what may have happened. For example, whether there is a hiatus, a sedimentation hiatus, something that may explain that. And we are trying to, you know, we model that, and obviously there is nothing of the kind. So, uh, other reactions were, well, why don't you move the occupation somewhere along the line where it will suit you best? But not with these terms, but in that kind of uh, sentence. And the most radical of all, I think just, just forget about it. And just forget about it. And this is why. Why forget about it? Because there is an assumption. There is a great assumption that these sites are built at once, lasted to 50 to 80 years, burned at once, and therefore there should be this massive occupation. Well, there is obvious contradiction between two images that I've showed you. And I suggest we don't make assumptions, but we do something else. So we stop with the assumptions and we do alternatives. So there are two other talks about this side on this conference. And if you haven't seen it, where have you been? Because now I'm going to tell you yet a third one. So uh, uh, the other two are just in the pipeline for publishing. So you haven't missed it, you will see. And the alternative, I have to thank Manuel, who has been very uh, persistent and was sort of trying to push me in the direction to think about a uh, different kind of social organization, which is he's the co-editor of a volume, and that the, the, the full version of that will come in a volume that uh, Manuel is co-editing. And he pushed me in the direction of thinking of bottom-up uh, kind of organization, which is, we all say, mm, but I'm planning, hmm, how is that going? Right, okay, let's see. So the alternative I took is to look at, uh, I know that there's a huge debate, well, huge. There is a debate about segmentary societies and archaeology. I'm not going to talk about those. What I'm inspired here is by uh, Hans Peter Hahn, who <laughs> was, he's an anthropologist, who uh, is a, a very good article about the failure of the colonial um, authorities when they go into sub-Saharan Africa and expecting exactly what he's coming with his colonial power. One man in charge, and I'll go to seat another man in charge and everything will be sorted, only to find out that there is no such thing and there are these invisible ties crossed across the landscape and there is this massively resistant society which actually functions in a different way, which the colonial power cannot cope with that. So I'm taking that as an inspiration of my model. And the second thing that I'm taking from the inspiration of my model, this is, a, this is an archaeological one. This is uh, in central, um, central Mexico. And it's, there is a lot of evidence that exactly at the moment of the conquistador, so there is a, there is a, a lot of written evidence for, for this. <coughs> and basically, this is a, what we try as archaeologists to do is try to see how do society function. And can we actually infer how they function on the basis of spatial, because that's what we see, we see some spatial patterns. And we can try to link the two and try to make sense of what actually is going on. So the translation of, of, of this altipetal, which is a story from my Aztec, if you speak Aztec, Aztec, and I pronounce it any well. So uh, that's, uh, it's translated as a town or a king. So they don't make, they really don't, it, it, there is no difference between the two and the, Really? Okay. I have to go quickly then. And then what really is good about this is that the key is that is uh, the society, the function of the uh, of of the altipetal that is segmentary and cellular, which is to say that uh, each of these altipetals has eight segments. And as you can see here, the, the center of these altipetals are these uh, uh, these squares. And if you populate that, the, the important point here to see is that it functions in that way. It goes. Uh, it rotates, and uh, that rotating suggests um, the tribute, the, the rotation, the, the, the um, pattern in which every of each of these uh, cells has to pay tribute to the public architecture, which is here. And if you put archaeological sites around, you can get, uh, that's, that's the point that he's making, you can make totally wrong decisions, uh, totally wrong implications, because this is, this is one thing, basically. But if you see it like that, what you can infer, as it goes with that, what we do, is that there is an urban core in which these things are related to that one, actually that belongs to that one. So there is no specific identity which is formed here. The other thing that will come out of that, because there is this different density, you will say, oh, there is a high density, this is countryside and this is central. There is no such thing. It, just, it was fine just now. 
<laughs> and then you will say that there are three, uh, three way hierarchy. Well, there is no three way hierarchy because this is the same thing. Okay, so, right. So this is the, what is the current theory. I have no time to tell you about that. So that's why I'll go to what I'm going to tell you. So, so we, what are the reasons that people can actually get together? And these are the positive reasons why people get together, not the negative reasons which the, I put forward. This is the defense, attack, people coming in. I suggest that this is why people get together and what they do. Get together, that's what they do. They do this, this is about both hundred houses, and that's how they start to live in that place in the Belichta. And that according to distributed governance, and what is there? Okay, so I suggest that only 40, 400 houses were occupied rather than the whole thing, and this that's what is the amount of population. I suggest that seven to ten houses were burned every year, and then also that every year, one third, similar to what I was saying about the rotation model, was actually responsible for the running of the place. And what was the place doing? Was doing exactly what you will call urban function. So that's what it is. And one of these plants was responsible for doing that. And how are they eating and what they were eating? Well, they were having this some small time uh, uh, husbandry and horticulture. But crucially, and that's where it comes from the segmentary society and uh, what Kurt was saying, the, a big portion of what they were consuming actually is coming from, from their, their distributed uh, um, social group across the landscape. Do we have them? Uh, I can tell you, but you will, yes, we do. If you were on, on one of the other uh, uh, talks, you would hear that the social catchment area, not the rest of the social catchment area of, of our site is about 100 kilometers. Do we have sites in these 100 kilometers that will actually be able to fit and help uh, this cause? Yes, we do. There are caveats to that, but I have no time to tell you. If you do, I'll tell you what are the caveats. Is it urban? This is the last one. <laughs> no, uh, this is the, right. Okay, so if you ask us to put uh, what we think is urban and we make a list of it, I can bet you that by the end of the day, we'll never agree that what I'm presenting, what the last person is presenting is the same thing. We'll say no. And why is that? Because we use different criteria. But we have, uh, Earth is very popular, everybody's using it, but I keep forgetting that he said also that. You have to make that this is highly contextual thing. This is not an absolute thing, it's a contextual thing, and that's why we have to think about it. And I'll give you an example. I was going to this place, which is uh, one million person, people, and it's a city. It's the capital of Bulgaria. I live in that place, 15,000 people, hardly. And it's also a city, because it has a cathedral. These two have a two different criteria of what, why there is a city. And nobody seems to have a problem with that. But when we go to the prehistory, we have a great problem to use different criteria. Why? So what I suggest, we have to do a relational approach. We have to look at the evidence in a different way, not absolutely, because you will go nowhere. These two places will never be cities if you look to your absolute categories. And therefore, Nebelivka should make sense only when you look at it in a local context, which really stands out as something very, very, very different rather than in absolute things. It will never compare to near East, and I don't even invite you to compare it to near East because it's not the same thing. So that's the conclusion. So I suggest that we should not do assumptions and we should not dismiss evidence just because they don't fit what we want to, to hear. Sorry. Uh, then I suggested that uh, the model that we did accounts for this. I didn't have time to talk about the materialized hierarchy, but this is now we are okay with it. These two images that I showed at the beginning are okay. And urban is not a fixed category. And we have to think as a, as a, as a highly contextual thing. Thank you very much. I think I did it on time. Thank you very much.